Roughing It in the Bush by Susanna Moody. Chapter twenty eight Canadian Sketches. Part one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Moira Fogarty. Roughing It in the Bush by Susanna Moody. Chapter twenty eight Canadian Sketches. Part one. The preceding sketches of Canadian life, as the reader may well suppose, are necessarily tinctured with somewhat sombre hues, imparted by the difficulties and privations with which, for so many years, the writer had to struggle. But we should be sorry, should these truthful pictures of scenes and characters, observed fifteen or twenty years ago, have the effect of conveying erroneous impressions of the present state of a country which is manifestly destined, at no remote period, to be one of the most prosperous in the world. Had we merely desired to please the imagination of our readers, it would have been easy to have painted the country and the people, rather as we could have wished them to be, than as they actually were at the period to which our description refers. And probably, what is thus lost in truthfulness, it would have gained in popularity with that class of readers who peruse books more for amusement than instruction. When I say that Canada is destined to be one of the most prosperous countries in the world, let it not be supposed that I am influenced by any unreasonable partiality for the land of my adoption. Canada may not possess mines of gold or silver, but she possesses all those advantages of climate, geological structure, and position which are essential to greatness and prosperity. Her long and severe winter so disheartening to her first settlers, lays up amidst the forest of the West inexhaustible supplies of fertilizing moisture for the summer, while it affords the farmer the very best of natural roads to enable him to carry his wheat and other produce to market. It is a remarkable fact that hardly a lot of land containing two hundred acres in British America can be found without an abundant supply of water at all seasons of the year and a very small proportion of the land itself is naturally unfit for cultivation. To crown the whole, where can a country be pointed out which possesses such an extent of internal navigation? A chain of river navigation and navigable inland seas, which, with the canals recently constructed, gives to the countries bordering on them all the advantages of an extended sea-coast, with a greatly diminished risk of loss from shipwreck. Little did the modern discoverers of America dream, when they called this country Canada, from the exclamation of one of the exploring party, Akanada, there is nothing here, as the story goes, that Canada would far outstrip those lands of gold and silver in which their imaginations reveled, in that real wealth of which gold and silver are but the portable representatives. The interminable forests, that most gloomy and forbidding feature in its scenery to the European stranger, should have been regarded as the most certain proof of its fertility. The severity of the climate, and the incessant toil of clearing the land, to enable the first settlers to procure the mere necessaries of life, have formed in its present inhabitants an indomitable energy of character, which, whatever may be their faults, must be regarded as a distinguishing attribute of the Canadians in common with our neighbors of the United States. When we consider the progress of the northern races of mankind, it cannot be denied that while the struggles of the hardy races of the North, with their severe climate and their forests, have gradually endowed them with an unconquerable energy of character, which has enabled them to become the masters of the world, the inhabitants of more favored climates, where the earth almost spontaneously yields all the necessaries of life, have remained comparatively feeble and inactive, or have sunk into sloth and luxury. It is unnecessary to quote any other instances in proof of this obvious fact than the progress of Great Britain and the United States of America, which have conquered as much by their industry as by their swords. Our neighbors of the United States are in the habit of attributing their wonderful progress in improvements of all kinds to their republican institutions. This is no doubt quite natural in a people who have done so much for themselves in so short a time, but when we consider the subject in all its bearings, it may be more truly asserted that, 
with any form of government not absolutely despotic, the progress of North America, peopled by a civilized and energetic race, with every motive to industry and enterprise in the nature of the country itself, must necessarily have been rapid. An unbounded extent of fertile soil, with an increasing population, were circumstances which of themselves were sufficient to create a strong desire for the improvement of internal communications, as, without common roads, railroads, or canals, the interior of the country would have been unfit to be inhabited by any but absolute barbarians. All the first settlers of America wanted was to be left to themselves. When we compare the progress of Great Britain with that of North America, the contrast is sufficiently striking to attract our attention. While the progress of the former has been the work of ages, North America has sprung into wealth and power almost within a period which we can remember. But the colonists of North America should recollect, when they indulge in such comparisons, that their British ancestors took many centuries to civilize themselves, before they could send free and intelligent settlers to America. The necessity for improvements in the internal communications is vastly more urgent in a widely extended continent than in an island no part of which is far removed from the sea coast, and patriotism, as well as self-interest, would readily suggest such improvements to the minds of a people who inherited the knowledge of their ancestors, and were besides stimulated to extraordinary exertions by their recently acquired independence. As the political existence of the United States commenced at a period when civilization had made great progress in the mother country, their subsequent improvement would, for various reasons, be much more rapid than that of the country from which they originally emigrated. To show the influence of external circumstances on the characters of men, let us just suppose two individuals, equal in knowledge and natural capacity, to be placed, the one on an improved farm in England, with the necessary capital and farm stock, and the other in the wilds of America, with no capital but his labor, and the implements required to clear the land for his future farm. In which of these individuals might we reasonably expect to find the most energy, ingenuity, and general intelligence on subjects connected with their immediate interests? No one who has lived for a few years in the United States or Canada can hesitate for a reply. The farmer in the more improved country generally follows the beaten track, the example of his ancestors, or the successful one of his more intelligent contemporaries. He is rarely compelled to draw upon his individual mental resources. Not so with the colonist. He treads in tracks but little known. He has to struggle with difficulties on all sides. Nature looks sternly on him, and in order to preserve his own existence, he must conquer nature, as it were, by his perseverance and ingenuity. Each fresh conquest tends to increase his vigor and intelligence, until he becomes a new man, with faculties of mind which, but for his severe lessons in the school of adversity, might have lain for ever dormant. While America presents the most forbidden aspect to the new settler, it at the same time offers the richest rewards to stimulate his industry. On the one hand, there is want and misery, on the other, abundance and prosperity. There is no middle course for the settler. He must work or starve. In North America there is another strong incentive to improvement, to be found in the scarcity of labor, and still more, therefore, than in Europe must every mechanical contrivance which supersedes manual labor tend to increase the prosperity of the inhabitants. When these circumstances are duly considered, we need no longer wonder at the rapid improvements in labor-saving machinery and in the means of internal communication throughout the United States. But for the steam engine, canals, and railroads, North America would have remained for ages a howling wilderness of endless forests, and instead of the busy hum of men and the sound of the mill and steam engine, we should now have heard nothing but the melancholy roar of unfrequented floods. The scenes and characters presented to the reader in the preceding pages belong in some measure rather to the past than the present state of Canada. In the last twenty years great changes have taken place, 
as well in the external appearance of the country as in the general character of its inhabitants. In many localities where the land was already under the plough, the original occupants of the soil have departed to renew their endless wars with the giants of the forest, in order to procure more land for their increasing families, where it could be obtained at a cheaper price. In the backwoods, forests have been felled, the blackened stumps have disappeared, and regular furrows are formed by the ploughman, where formerly he had not time or inclination to whistle at his work. A superior class of farmers has sprung up, whose minds are as much improved by cultivation as their lands, and who are comfortably settled on farms supposed to be exhausted of their fertility by their predecessors. As the breadth of land recovered from the forest is increased, villages, towns, and cities have grown up and increased in population and wealth, in proportion to the productiveness of the surrounding country. In Canada it is particularly to be noted that there is hardly any intermediate stage between the rude toil and privation of the backwoods, and the civilization, comfort, and luxury of the towns and cities, many of which are to outward appearance entirely European, with the encouraging prospect of a continual increase in the value of fixed property. When a colony, capable from the fertility of the soil and abundance of moisture, of supporting a dense population, has been settled by a civilized race, they are never long in establishing a communication with the sea-coast and with other countries. When such improvements have been effected, the inhabitants may be set at once to take their proper place among civilized nations. The elements of wealth and power are already there, and time and population only are required fully to develop the resources of the country. Unhappily, the natural progress of civilized communities in our colonies is too often obstructed by the ignorance of governments, and unwise or short-sighted legislation, and abundance of selfish men are always to be found in the colonies themselves, who, destitute of patriotism, greedily avail themselves of this ignorance, in order to promote their private interests at the expense of the community. Canada has been greatly retarded in its progress by such causes, and this will, in a great measure, account for its backwardness when compared with the United States, without attributing the difference to the different forms of government. It was manifestly the intention of the British government, in conferring representative institutions on Canada, that the people should enjoy all the privileges of their fellow subjects in the mother country. The more to assimilate our government to that of its great original, the idea was, for some time entertained, of creating a titled and hereditary aristocracy. But it was soon found that though the king can make a belted knight, a marquis, duke, and all that, it was not in his power to give permanency to an institution which, in its origin, was as independent as royalty itself, arising naturally out of the feudal system, but which was utterly inconsistent with the genius and circumstances of a modern colony. The sovereign might endow the members of such an aristocracy with grants of the lands of the crown to support their dignity, but what benefit could such grants be, even to the recipients, in a country covered with boundless forests and nearly destitute of inhabitants? It is obvious that no tenants could be found to pay rents for such lands, or indeed even to occupy them, while lands could be purchased on easy terms in the United States or in Canada itself. Had this plan been carried out, Canada would have been a doomed country for centuries. The strongest incitements to industry are required, those of proprietorship and ultimate independence, to induce settlers to encounter all the privations and toil of a new settlement in such a country. A genuine aristocracy can only exist in a country already peopled, and which has been conquered and divided among the conquerors. In such a state of things, Aristocracy, though artificial in its origin, becomes naturalized, if I may use the expression, and even, as in Great Britain, when restrained within proper limits, highly beneficial in advancing civilization. Be it for good or be it for evil, it is worse than useless to disguise the fact that the government of a modern colony, where every conquest is made from the forest by little at a time, must be essentially republican. 
any allusion to political parties is certainly foreign to the object of the preceding sketches, but it is impossible to make the British reader acquainted with the various circumstances which retarded the progress of this fine colony, without explaining how the patronage of the local government came formally to be so exclusively bestowed on one class of the population, thus creating a kind of spurious aristocracy which disgusted the colonists and drove emigration from our shores to those of the United States. After the American Revolution, considerable numbers of loyalists in the United States voluntarily relinquished their homesteads and property, and came to Canada, which then, even on the shores of Lake Ontario, was a perfect wilderness. Lands were of course granted to them by the government, and very naturally these settlers were peculiarly favoured by the local authorities. These loyalists were generally known by the name of Tories to distinguish them from the Republicans, and forming the great mass of the population. Any one who called himself a reformer was regarded with distrust and suspicion as a concealed Republican or rebel. It must not, however, be supposed that these loyalists were really Tories in their political principles. Their notions on such subjects were generally crude and undefined and living in a country where the whole construction of society and habits of feeling were decidedly republican, the term Tory, when adopted by them, was certainly a misnomer. However, hated by and hating as cordially the Republican Party in the United States, they by no means unreasonably considered that their losses and their attachment to British institutions gave them an almost exclusive claim to the favour of the local government in Canada. Thus the name of U.E., United Empire Loyalist or Tory, came to be considered an indispensable qualification for every office in the colony. This was all well enough, so long as there was no other party in the country. But gradually a number of other American settlers flowed into Canada from the United States, who had no claim to the title of Tories or Loyalists, but who in their feelings and habits were probably not much more Republican than their predecessors. These were of course regarded with peculiar jealousy by the older or loyalist settlers from the same country. It seemed to them as if a swarm of locusts had come to devour their patrimony. This will account for the violence of party feeling which lately prevailed in Canada. There is nothing like a slight infusion of self-interest to give point and pungency to party feeling. The British immigrants, who afterwards flowed into this colony in greater numbers, of course brought with them their own particular political predilections. They found what was called Toryism and High Churchism in the ascendant, and self-interest or prejudice induced most of the more early settlers of this description to fall in with the more powerful and favoured party, while influenced by the representations of the old Loyalist party they shunned the other American settlers as Republicans. In the meantime, however, the descendants of the original Loyalists were becoming numerous, while the government became unable to satisfy them all, according to their own estimation of their merits. And as High Churchism was, unfortunately for the peace of society, associated with Toryism, every shade of religious dissent, as well as political difference of opinion, generally added to the numbers and power of the Reform Party, which was now beginning to be known in the colony. Strange to say, the great bulk of the present Reform Party is composed of the descendants of these U.E. Loyalists, while many of our most ultra-Tories are the descendants of Republican settlers from the United States. As may be supposed, thirty years of increasing emigration from the mother country has greatly strengthened the Reform Party and they now considerably outnumber the Conservatives. While the mass of the people held Tory, or, I should rather call them, Conservative principles, our government seemed to work as well as any representative government may be supposed to work, without the necessary check of a constitutional opposition. Favoritism was, of course, the order of the day, and the Governor, for the time being, filled up all offices according to his will and pleasure, without many objections being made by the people as to the qualifications of the favourite parties, provided the selections for office were made from the powerful party. 
large grants of land were given to favoured individuals in the colony or to immigrants who came with commendations from the home government. In such a state of matters, the people certainly possessed the external form of a free government, but as an opposition party gradually acquired an ascendancy in the lower house of Parliament, they were unable to carry the measures adopted by their majority into operation. In consequence of the systematic opposition of the legislative and executive councils, which were generally formed exclusively from the old Conservative Party. Whenever the Conservatives obtained the majority in the House of Assembly, the Reformers, in retaliation, as systematically opposed every measure. Thus a constant bickering was kept up between the parties in Parliament, while the people, amidst these attentions, lost sight of the true interests of the country, and improvements of all kinds came nearly to a standstill. As matters were then conducted, it would have been much better had the colony been ruled by a governor and council, for in that case beneficial measures might have been carried into effect. Such a state of things could not last long, and the discontent of a large portion of the people, terminating through the indiscretion of an infatuated local government in actual rebellion, soon produced the remedy. The party generally most powerful in the legislative assembly, and the members of which had been so long and so unconstitutionally excluded from holding offices under the government, at once obtained the position which they were entitled, and the people being thus given the power of governing by their majorities in Parliament, improvements of all kinds are steadily advancing up the present moment, and their prosperity and contentment have increased in an equal proportion. Had the first settlement of Canada been conducted on sound and philosophical principles, much hardship and privation, as well as loss of capital in land speculations, would have been saved to its first settlers, and the country, improved and improving as it now is, would have presented a very different aspect at the present time. With the best intentions, the British government may be justly accused of gross ignorance of the true principles of colonization and the local governments are still more open to the accusation of squandering the resources of the colony, its lands, in building up the fortunes of a would-be aristocracy, who, being non-resident proprietors of wild lands, necessarily obstructed the progress of improvement, while the people were tantalized with the empty semblance of a free government. No sooner did emigrants from Great Britain begin to pour into Upper Canada, so as to afford a prospect of the wild lands becoming saleable, then a system of land speculation was resorted to by many of the old colonists. This land speculation has no doubt enriched many individuals, but more than any other abuse has it retarded the natural progress of the country, and the interests of the many have thus been sacrificed to those of the few. Almost all other speculations may be said, in one shape or another, to do good, but land speculation has been an unmitigated curse to Canada, because it occasions a monopoly of the soil, and prevents it from being cleared and rendered productive, until the speculators can obtain their own price for it. The lands granted to soldiers and sailors who had served in Canada, and those granted to the U.E. loyalists, were bought up, often at merely nominal prices, from the original grantees and their children, and sold again with an immense profit to new settlers from the old country, or retained for many years in an unproductive state. A portion of the lands granted to the U.E. loyalists was, of course, occupied by the heads of families, but the lands to which their children became entitled, under the same benevolent provision of the government, were generally drawn in remote situations. By far the larger portion of these grants, however, were not located or rendered available by the grantees but remained in the shape of U.E. rights, which were purchased at very low prices by the speculators. These U.E. rights were bought at the rate of one shilling threepence, two shilling sixpence, or three shilling ninepence per acre, and it was by no means uncommon for old soldiers to sell one hundred acres of land for two or three dollars, or even for a bottle of rum, so little value did they set on such grants in the then state of Canada. These grants, though well meant, and with respect to the U.E. loyalists perhaps unavoidable, have been most injurious to the country. 
the great error in this matter, and which could have been avoided, was the opening of too great an extent of land at once for settlement. A contrary system, steadily pursued, would have produced a concentrated population, and the resources of such a population would have enabled the colonists, by uniting their labor and capital, to make the means of communication in some degree keep pace with the settlement of the lands. And Upper Canada would now have been as well provided with canals and railroads as the United States. The same abuses, no doubt, existed formerly to as great an extent in that country, but, being longer settled, it has outgrown the evil. Enough has been said on this subject to show some of the causes which have retarded improvements in Canada. Another chief cause of the long and helpless torpor in which the country lay was the absence of municipal governments in the various rural localities. It indeed seems strange that such a simple matter as providing the means of making roads and bridges by local assessment could not have been conceded to the people, who, if we suppose them to be gifted with common sense, are much more capable of understanding and managing their own parish business than any government, however well disposed to promote their interests. Formerly the government of Upper Canada was deluged with petitions for grants of money from Parliament to be expended in improvements in this or that locality, of the reasonableness of which claims the majority of the legislators were, of course, profoundly ignorant. These money grants became subjects of a species of jobbing or manoeuvring among the members of the House of Assembly, and he was considered the best member who could get the most money for his county. Commissioners resident in the particular localities were appointed to superintend these public works, and as these commissioners were generally destitute of practical knowledge, these parliamentary grants were usually expended without producing equivalent results. Nothing in the abstract is more reasonable than that any number of individuals should be allowed to associate themselves for the purpose of effecting some local improvement, which would be beneficial to others as well as to themselves. But nothing of this could be attempted without an act of Parliament, which, of course, was attended with expense and delay, if not disappointment. The time and attention of the provincial Parliament were thus occupied with a mass of parish business, which could have been much better managed by the people themselves on the spot. When the union of the two provinces was in contemplation, it became evident that the business of such an extended colony could not be carried on in the United Parliament, were it to be encumbered and distracted with the contending claims of so many localities. This consideration led to the establishment of the district, now county, municipal councils. These municipal councils were denounced by the Conservative Party at the time as a step towards republicanism. Were this true, it would only prove that the government of our republican neighbours is better than our own, for these municipal institutions have been eminently beneficial to Canada. But municipal councils are necessarily no more republican in their nature than the House of Commons in England. However this may be, the true prosperity of Upper Canada may be mainly attributed to their influence on the minds of the people. Possessing many of the external forms of a Parliament, they are admirable political schools for a free people. The most intelligent men in the different townships are freely elected by the inhabitants, and assemble in the county town to deliberate and make by-laws, to levy taxes, and, in short, to do everything which in their judgment will promote the interest of their constituents. Having previously been solely occupied in agricultural pursuits, it might naturally be expected that their first notions would be somewhat crude, and that they would have many long-cherished prejudices to overcome. Their daily intercourse with the more educated inhabitants of the towns, however, tended to remove these prejudices, while new ideas were continually presented to their minds. The rapidity with which this species of practical education is acquired is remarkable, and also how soon men with such limited opportunities of acquiring knowledge learn to think and to express their views and opinions in appropriate language. These municipal councillors go home among their constituents, where they have to explain and defend their proceedings. While so engaged, they have occasion to communicate facts and opinions which are fairly discussed, and thus enlightened views are diffused through the mass of people. 
the councillors at first were averse to the imposition or increase of taxation, however desirable the object might be. But pride and emulation very soon overcame this natural reluctance, and the example of some neighbouring county, with that natural desire to do good which, more or less, influences the feelings and conduct of all public men, were not long in producing their beneficial results, even with the risk of offending their constituents. When the county municipal councils were first established, the warden or president of the council, and also the treasurer, were appointed by the governor. But both these offices were afterwards made elective, the warden being elected by the council from their own body, and the treasurer being selected by them without previous election by the people. Lately, councils have been also established in each township for municipal purposes affecting the interest of the township only, the reeves or presidents of which minor councils form the members of the county council. This general system of municipalities and a late act of the provincial parliament enabling the inhabitants to form themselves into road companies have converted the formerly torpid and inactive townships into busy hives of industry and progressive improvement. Our agricultural societies have also played no mean part in furthering the progress of the colony. In colonies fewer prejudices are entertained on the subject of agricultural matters than on any others, and the people are ever ready to try any experiment which offers any prospect of increased remuneration for labor. Education of late has also made rapid advances in this province, and now the yeomanry of the more improved townships, though they may be inferior to the yeomanry of England in the acquirements derived from common school education, are certainly far superior to them in general intelligence. Their minds are better stocked with ideas, and they are infinitely more progressive. When we consider the relative periods at which the first settlements were formed in the United States and in Upper Canada, and the accumulation of capital in the former, it will not be difficult to show that the progress of Canada has been much more rapid. The excavation of the Erie Canal, the parent of all the subsequent improvements of a similar nature in the United States, opened up for settlement a vast country to the westward, which would otherwise for many years have remained a wilderness, unfit for the habitation of man. The boundless success of this experiment necessarily led to all the other similar undertakings. The superior advantages Canada enjoyed in her river and lake navigation, imperfect as that navigation was, operated in a manner rather to retard than to accelerate improvements of this kind, while the construction of the Erie Canal was a matter of prospective necessity in order to provide for a rapidly increasing population and immigration. In the same manner, the recent completion of the works on the St. Lawrence, and the enlargement of the Welland Canal, connecting Lakes Erie and Ontario, will just as necessarily be followed by similar results, with the additional advantage of the whole colony being greatly benefited by the commerce of the United States in addition to her own. We have now, thanks to responsible government, municipal councils, and common schools, no longer any reason to consider their institutions better calculated to develop the resources of the colony than our own. Our interests are almost identical, and with our canals and railroads on both sides mutually beneficial, our former hostility has merged into a friendly rivalry in the march of intellect, and we may now truly say that, without wishing for any change in political institutions which are most congenial to the feelings of the people where they exist, each country now sincerely rejoices in the prosperity of its neighbour. Before concluding this chapter, I shall endeavour to give the reader a short description of the county of Hastings, in which I have held the office of sheriff for the last twelve years, and which I believe possesses many advantages as a place of settlement over all the other places I have seen in the upper province. I should premise, however, lest my partiality for this part of the colony should be supposed to incline me to overrate its comparative advantages to the settler, that my statements are principally intended to show the progress of Upper Province generally, and that when I claim any superiority for this part of it, I shall give, what I trust the reader will consider, satisfactory reasons for my conclusion. End of Chapter 28, Part 1 Recorded in Toronto, Ontario, by Moira Fogarty, 
December 2008.